With the release of Halo Combat Evolved on the original Xbox in 2001, Bungie solidified its standing in the games industry as a prolific studio. Bungie revolutionized the first-person shooter genre for consoles, while at the same time propelling Microsoft's new system into the same conversations as Sony and Nintendo. The daunting task of continuing a franchise with so much clout behind it was a tall order for Bungie, but they pulled off what some could say was the impossible, iterating on Halo's base and creating a multiplayer juggernaut in Halo 2, and ending the trilogy on a high note with the content-rich Halo 3. After three beloved games in the Halo franchise, Bungie was ready to move on to something bigger and better, and wanted to explore going independent, not wanting to be tied to a specific series or console. Microsoft and Bungie agreed to an amicable split, but Bungie had to produce two more Halo games for the Xbox 360. While Bungie's swan song, Halo Reach, was already in pre-production at this time, that left one Halo game for the studio to produce. With Halo's rising popularity, Microsoft looked to strike while the iron was hot, greenlighting a collaborative side project between Bungie and filmmaker Peter Jackson titled Halo Chronicles. Chronicles would be an episodic game more focused on a narrative and characters, but was quietly cancelled in 2009 due to budget cuts. The cancellation of Chronicles left a small portion of Bungie left without a project, but an opportunity to create something new. Thus, development on a traditional Halo game from a new perspective began. That game would be Halo 3 ODST. ODST started out as a small downloadable mini-campaign of sorts titled Halo 3 Recon. As the project grew in scope and scale, it was decided that ODST was to launch as a full retail release. Developed by a small team within Bungie composed of a handful of artists, engineers, programmers, as well as the musical duo of Marty O'Donnell and Michael Salvatore, Halo 3 ODST would be a side story focusing on the titular orbital drop shock troopers. ODST is unique among the Bungie-developed Halo games. It deviates from the power fantasy Halo was known for to instead put you in the boots of a ground soldier in the war against the Covenant. This shift in tone isn't just superficial, as the story, atmosphere, and gameplay were taken in new and interesting directions, differentiating itself from Halos 1, 2, and 3. Relax, rookie. He don't mean nothing. Besides, now's one of those times. Pays to be the strong, silent type. ODST takes place during the events of Halo 2, with players taking control of the Rookie, a new recruit to a squad of ODSTs who are about to drop into the African city of New Mombasa. During the drop, the Covenant carrier orbiting the city performs a slip space jump and sends out a shockwave, separating the group's pods and sending the Rookie off course. The Rookie's pod crash lands in the city as he's knocked unconscious. Now, a lot of video games, specifically shooters, start their game off this way, or at least have a scene similar to this where the hero's helicopter, plane, or vehicle crash in this exciting set piece. Seeing the whole process of the jump as you're pod is loaded up and fired towards the earth is visceral and immersive, and watching the carnage as the carrier jumps is visually impressive. This is juxtaposed to what happens when the rookie finally comes to. In other games, the protagonist usually wakes up relatively soon after the crash and gets right back into the fight. ODST handles it much differently, though. It's the dead of night as raindrops pepper the viewing port of the ODST pod. Six hours have passed since the drop as the rookie finally awakes in his pod, which is lodged in the side of a building. The player has essentially missed the entire story of the game at that point. It's here where ODST establishes what kind of experience it's going to be. I appreciate this opening more so now than I did when I first played ODST back in 2009. It plays off of your expectations with Halo's first levels, which are usually bombastic and action-packed, as ODST's opening started off as. But instead of blasting the door off your pod and fighting through hordes of Covenant soon after the drop, the rookie's left alone at night in a desolate city. ODST goes for this neo-noir visual style with emergency lights or the glow of Covenant barriers shining brightly against the stormy night. Halo's always had this timeless art style, I feel, and ODST still holds up in my opinion. New Mombasa's abandoned city streets are hauntingly beautiful, which has to do with lighting, Bungie's ever-present environmental storytelling, and some extremely impressive skyboxes. The tone of the game is set from then on. The rookie is separated from his team in an abandoned city only inhabited by the Covenant trying to kill him. This feeling of isolation is exemplified by the score. While ODST's soundtrack is missing the iconic monk chanting Halo's sound is known for, it's still authentic to the series. While it won't blow you away with epic tracks like in the previous titles, it doesn't have to, nor do I think it should. O'Donnell and Salvatore used instruments like pianos and saxophones to capture this somber tone that ties in perfectly with wandering around a rainy city alone at night. It creates this tangible atmosphere that it's so unlike most Halo games. Being alone as the Master Chief is vastly different than being alone as the Rookie, and this is executed brilliantly with the combination of its visual style and music.
ODST's atmosphere establishes a fantastic tone for the game as a whole, but what ties everything together is the story's presentation. ODST doesn't have much of a narrative for most of its approximately 5-6 to six hour runtime. It essentially boils down to the ODST squad being separated and trying to regroup and escape the city with their lives. Part of the reason this simple promise works has to do with the squad itself and the way the story is told. The group of hell jumpers comprises of Buck, portrayed by the ever charismatic Nathan Fillion, the gruff Dutch, played by Adam Baldwin, the sniper Romeo, voiced by industry veteran Nolan North, the sarcastic Mickey, played by Alan Tudyk, and the team leader Dare, portrayed by Trisha Helfer. Apparently Bungie are huge fans of Joss Whedon's Firefly. ODST does something unique as compared to previous Halo games with its characters. While the Chief, Cortana, Sergeant Johnson, and even the Arbiter are standout characters, Halo's never really had a great cast of supporting characters, expanded universe novels notwithstanding. Buck is probably the most fleshed out character of the bunch, which makes him a fan favorite, leading to his promotion to a Spartan and inclusion in Halo 5 Guardians. He's technically the leader of the ODST squad, caring for his squad mates and wanting to make sure they all make it out of the city alive. Mickey Duck! Status! Alive or dead, we're pulling them out. You hear me? Make some noise. I got your back. Dutch is the hardened vet of the group. He's about one thing and one thing only, killing any covenant in his way. He's also religious, oddly enough, which is strange considering the conflict he finds himself in. Ah, uh, Lord, I didn't train to be a pilot. Tell me I don't have any more flying to do today. Romeo is the laid-back sniper of the squad. While he'll fight to the death for his squad mates, he doesn't take things all too seriously. He's one tough trooper though, as he takes a gravity hammer to the chest but keeps on trucking. Hey, what the hell kind of armor was she wearing? Dunno, Mickey. I wasn't looking at her gear. Mickey is sort of the engineer of the group. He's a smart ass, being the most sarcastic of the bunch. He's also a big fan of explosions. What? Finally, there's Dare, a UNSC Navy captain and officer in the Office of Naval Intelligence, or ONI for short. She's the impromptu leader of the ODST's mission in New Mombasa, carefully guarding her ONI secrets causing strain on her and Buck's relationship, which is complicated to say the least. Must have met a lot of other saps since then. Why pick me for the safari? First, you're the best soldier I know, and second, I don't remember. That night, would you ask me in the morning? I remember not getting an answer. While Bungie would attempt something similar with Halo Reach, I feel ODST did a better job characterizing the squad as opposed to Noble Team. While they might be a bit one note, with very little time over the course of the game to dig deep into their motivations and stories, at the end of the day they're a likable cast of characters, even more so when you take into account ODST's storytelling. While the rookie is the central protagonist, he's not the only character players control. One of the most brilliant story decisions in ODST was the idea that, that the rookie was trying to piece together the events of what transpired while he was unconscious in his pod. He'll come across items in the city like a destroyed turret or a helmet of a teammate which will trigger a flashback of sorts that allows players to play through what happened previously that day. Granted, one could look at this and say that the story of ODST is the rookie wandering around New Mombasa, picking things up, looking at them for a bit, and then putting them down. And you'd, well, you'd be right for the most part. I personally don't see it that way though. Seeing the narrative play out through the eyes of Buck, Dutch, Romeo, and Mickey as their timelines slowly link up with the rookies is a new and interesting way to tell a story, not just in Halo, but for video games in general. It's been done in the past to varying degrees of success, an example being the memories you can trigger in Breath of the Wild, but it's done very effectively in ODST based on how it's implemented within Halo's fundamental gameplay. ODST's approach to its mission and level structure is unique to the Halo franchise and part of the reason why I admire it so much. Typically, Halo games are mission-based, going from level to level, usually with a cutscene or loading screen between each as you progress through the story. While ODST does have individual missions, they're accessed not through a menu or natural progression, but instead through the city of New Mombasa. While some might call New Mombasa an open world, I'd call it more of a hub. An open world implies a larger scale with side activities and additional content, which New Mombasa is not. It's more of a hub that houses access to ODST's levels rather than a living, breathing city. That's not to say the city's streets are devoid of anything interesting, though. There are covenant patrols that players can either engage or sneak around. It's interesting having organic encounters in Halo where I can see hunters off in the distance and just decide that's not worth trying. There are weapon or supply caches which players can only gain access to if they explore and find various terminals around the city. These caches can offer different weapons the rookie can use to make taking out patrols easier or more interesting. These caches also can house vehicles like the mongoose that can make traversing the city a breeze. The terminals I just mentioned are also where players can find the meat of 
the side content, and those are audio logs titled Sadie's Story. These audio files document a young woman's trials and tribulations as she tries to escape New Mombasa during the Covenant invasion. It's a great little side story that's well worth seeking out every terminal for. As the rookie traverses his way through the streets of the desolate city, he'll come across important objects like I mentioned earlier that'll tie to the events that happened previously that day to his lost squad mates. It's an incredibly effective setup in my opinion because it lends itself well to the story and atmosphere Bungie was striving for. Each mission is broken up by an exploration section through the streets of New Mombasa as players search for the next important object. Levels consist of your traditional Halo affair, fighting the Covenant throughout the city as you see the conflict through the eyes of your squad mates. Most involve your linear on-foot combat missions with vehicle or defensive sections to add variety. After completing a mission and getting a piece of the story, it's back to exploring the city at night. The change in both design and tone of from level to city creates a unique pace for ODST. It's the perfect mixture of new and classic design choices that made ODST feel fresh when it first launched and unique all these years later. Halo's core gameplay remains intact despite the change in protagonists. ODSTs are special forces soldiers, one step up from the UNSC Marines. While a formidable force, they're no Spartans, so Bungie had to change their size, movement, and capabilities on the battlefield to make the transition from super soldier to special ops seem more believable. ODSTs are shorter in stature, move slower, can't dual wield weapons or use equipment like bubble shields, and lack the armor capabilities of Spartans, meaning no rechargeable shields or regenerating health. A small touch I really appreciate is a change in FOV and weapon size as compared to Halo 3, making the weapons appear larger in the hands of the ODSTs as compared to Spartans. These changes may seem detrimental, effectively taking well-known and beloved abilities away from the player, and while I tend to agree, it's in service to the overall tone of the game, and it's not like Bungie tore mechanics out and didn't replace them with anything. There are two new weapons, new being a very relative term. There's a silenced version of the SMG and a Halo's iconic pistol. While the silenced aspect is merely for looks most of the time, sneaking around and taking grunts out stealthily is an option, which is a nice change of pace. The silenced SMG has the capability to zoom in, making longer ranged fights less hectic. It's a bit of a mix between the assault rifle and the battle rifle, and can be paired with the silenced pistol for classic Halo tactics, like draining shields with the high fire rate of the SMG, then switching to the pistol to get the finishing headshot. ODSTs also have access to the visor, an altered heads-up display that outlines player surroundings, including points of interest, enemies, and friendlies. Visor is a neat addition that gives players a slight edge in combat or exploration. With the recharging shields of previous games, players would tend to shoot first and ask questions later, running into a scrum hoping their shields would hold out longer than the enemies could. In ODST, it creates the opposite effect almost, where knowing exactly how many enemies there are in a given fight can be the edge, especially if the enemies haven't noticed you yet. This is especially important when health is taken into account. Similar to Combat Evolved, ODST employs a health system. A stamina meter at the top of the HUD is your first line of defense. Taking damage will deplete the stamina meter first, with any subsequent damage after the fact will result in losing health. Health that's lost doesn't simply regenerate, instead players have to search the environment for health packs like shooters of old. I've always had a soft spot for health systems in first person shooters. It adds an extra layer of tension that makes you think more about your engagements in battle because health is finite. This is where the visor comes in handy the most, highlighting enemies as you gauge exactly what you're going up against, and after the battle is won, pointing out nearby health packs and resources. Those are ODST's major mechanic changes though, the pillars of Halo's core gameplay are intact with the gunplay remaining as smooth as ever. Halo is in the upper echelon of the first person shooter genre for its control alone. Believe it or not, first person shooter control can be very easy to get wrong, and only the greats such as Halo, Doom, Call of Duty, and Bungie's own Destiny were able to master it, at least in consoles anyway. Bungie famously coined the 30 seconds of fun gameplay loop ideology, in where all game development can be boiled down to creating a really fun 30 seconds of gameplay, and iterating on that 30 seconds in various ways throughout the game. Halo's 30 second gameplay loop comprises of three core mechanics, shooting, tossing grenades, and meleeing. Shooting feels remarkable in Halo games, and ODST is no exception. Firing from the hip or zooming in with certain weapons feels effortless. There's a complex simplicity to Halo's combat, and that has to do with its sandbox. Halo's weapon sandbox has always been spectacular, and even with the restrictions of the orbital drop shock troopers, ODST holds up solely on the various weapons players can wield. We already covered the new SMG and pistol, but there's a lot of variety here. UNSC weapons like the sniper or shotgun feel great, and give players an advantage at either far away or close range, respectively. Spartan laser is the most effective for taking out big threats like deadly hunters or pesky banshees above the battlefield, where things get truly interesting or with a covenant weaponry. Most if not all covenant weapons differentiate themselves from UNSC weapons based on the fact that the covenant weapons are projectile based, whereas the UNSC weapons are hit scan. There's the always fun to use needler, which fires homing explosive needles towards your foes, a semi-auto carbine that's great for long range and popping off headshots, plasma weapons of the pistol and rifle variety are particularly useful for taking out enemy shields. Having a wide variety of weapons to choose from makes each enemy encounter differ based Based on your preference. There are four different grenade types players have access to throughout ODST's campaign, and they all have purpose and possess unique properties. Standard frags are the most common and can devastate groups of enemies with a well-placed throw. Halo's iconic sticky grenades, well, stick 
that's incredibly satisfying to hit an enemy with a sticker grenade. Spike grenades act in a similar manner, but can also be affixed to the environment, sticking to the walls or other objects as well as enemies. Finally, there's the fire bombs, which are self-explanatory, engulfing anything unlucky enough in a blaze of fire. While there's very few times where players have access to all four types, it can certainly be fun cycling through the grenades you have, equipping the right one for whatever situation you find yourself in. Tossing frags into a group of grunts, or saving your sticky grenade for that tougher brute chieftain, are more variables added to Halo's combat. Melee, while not the most complex option in combat, is still vital in the heat of the battle. While it's lethal for weaker enemies, it can drop the shields of brutes as well. Whether you're punching grunts in the face or fending off a brute bull rushing you, meleeing is a key component of Halo's combat triangle. The beauty in Halo's combat is utilizing the right tactic for the right situation. The assault rifle or SMG is great for pumping lead into your enemies, but isn't as effective against brute's shield as plasma rifles are. Sticking an enemy can cause them to freak out and run into their squad mates, killing more than you expected. Meleeing unsuspecting enemies from behind can result in an insta-kill. These small touches and variations on each aspect of Halo's combat is why it can be so special. While most shooters have these aspects, some of which are even objectively better than Halo's, the reason why Halo's gameplay is so much fun is its combat triangle and weapon sandbox coexisting perfectly with its enemy AI. Halo's enemy variety is the key to its success when you get down to it. In other shooters, there's very little variety in what you actually shoot. While there are some exceptions, like Doom, the majority of shooters during Halo's heyday and even today miss this key aspect, usually consisting of 90% bog standard foot soldiers, maybe heavy weapons or grenadier combatant if you're lucky. The Covenant are full of fun creatures to fight. From the bottom up, you have grunts, drones, jackals, brutes, and hunters. Although ODST lacks the series' iconic elite enemies for canonical reasons, Bungie did add in the new engineers to round out the ranks of the Covenant. What makes Halo's enemies and AI enjoyable to fight is how varied each encounter can be based on their weapons and behaviors. Grunts are cannon fodder for the most part. They're easily dispatched, especially with a well-placed headshot. While most grunts wield fairly weaker weapons like plasma pistols or needlers, some can carry the deadly fuel rod cannon, making them more of a threat. Grunts by nature are cowards, so when their leader is killed, they begin to panic, often running away in a frenzy. Despite this, they're not above dying for for their cause, as they can suicide charge players with sticky grenades affixed to both hands. Drones are aerial threats. They're fast, usually swarming the player in groups of 5 to 10. They wield plasma pistols and rifles, so while they're not much of a threat alone, they can be lethal in groups. Being airborne takes the player's attention away from the ground forces and can render close range or semi-automatic weapons near useless based on their speed and flight patterns. Jackals are a threat at any range. Most are outfitted with shields the player has to wear down with constant fire or a melee attack. Firing a well-placed shot in the small opening on the side can bypass its shield completely. Some attack from behind enemy lines with carbines, peppering the player as the rest of its squad pushes up. They're especially deadly in large areas, where jackals can wield the beam rifle and pick players off from across the battlefield. Brutes are the toughest enemies you'll face consistently. They have shields you'll have to take down in order to do damage to them. Doing so will cause them to go into a frenzy and charge the player in a last ditch effort to take them out. Taking them out first is usually a good strategy, as once they're down, the grunts they're leading will scatter, making them easier targets. They're the most versatile when it comes to weapon variety, wielding anything from spikers to plasma rifles to brute shots to gravity hammers. There are various ranks of brutes as well. Blue armored brutes are the most common, with golden armored brutes having better shield and more health. There's brutes with jetpacks that can hop around the battlefield, as well as the chieftains who wield the aforementioned gravity hammers. The engineers are the new addition to ODST, and they're one of the most interesting enemies, at least in my opinion. Engineers are defensive units who hover above the battlefield out of the range of most gunfire. Their sole purpose is to grant enhanced shields to all enemies within range of it, from grunts to brutes. The shields provided by the engineers are extremely hard to break, and can be applied after they're taken down. The key is to target any engineer first before it can buff an entire Covenant squad. Engineers are highly combustible though, so taking one out will cause a chain reaction of explosions that can be used to your advantage. ODST's enemies aren't just static though, they can move around the environment organically, jumping down from their perches or climbing on objects to get a better shot. Grunts and brutes can man turrets or hop in vehicles and change their tactics up. They can also toss grenades to flush players out of their hiding spots. At this point I think you get the picture. Halo's enemy AI is impressive and leads to Halo having some of the most unique enemy encounters in game. The synchronization of Halo's weapon sandbox and enemy AIs is the sole reason Halo has been and continues to be successful from a critical and financial standpoint. That's what sets it apart from the majority of shooters out there and creates those constant memorable 30 seconds of gameplay. I know what you're thinking. Sergeant Major Johnson, these sound like overwhelming odds. I don't want to drop into hell without an airtight insurance policy. In 2008, the shooter landscape would be changed forever with the release of Gears of War 2 and the inclusion of Horde Mode, a cooperative, wave-based survival mode tasking players to survive as long as possible 
possible against legions of enemies. Those who know me well know I love a good wave defense mode, from Gears to Nazi Zombies to Left 4 Dead to Splatoon 2 to Saints Row 3. While Bungie were mainly innovators in the industry, they weren't above riding trends, and thus Halo 3 ODST launched with its own co-op wave defense mode, Firefight. Firefight was initially the reason I pre-ordered ODST in the first place. While it might seem simple on the surface, it's this marriage of campaign and multiplayer that remains enjoyable to this day. Its setup is great, having five waves of enemies that progressively get stronger as the round goes on. Defeating all five waves clears the round. Clear all three rounds to win. Your team of up to four has a shared life pool of seven, and depleting them is game over. Kills, assists, and sprees all rack up the points and give it this arcade-like feel. There's even skulls similar to campaign that add difficulty multipliers to your score, as well as change up each game of firefight. All the maps are repurposed from the campaign, particularly the defense sections of certain levels. There's a good variety that change up what enemies you'll face. For example, Crater is relatively small, so you'll face traditional foot soldiers, but Lost Platoon is huge, which means enemy vehicles like wraiths or choppers can enter the mix. Overall, Firefight is a lot of fun, at least in my opinion. While it did return in Reach, I feel ODST's variant is superior, primarily because you're not Spartans. Being weaker ODSTs, just like in the campaign, gives this greater sense of tension and demands adequate teamwork to survive, since teams have to ration important aspects like ammo and health packs throughout the waves. Blazing around the battlefield as a Spartan made the mode feel more like a chore than a fight to survive. Firefight wasn't the only multiplayer offering ODST launched with. Packed in on a separate disc was the entire suite of Halo 3's multiplayer. In the age of the Master Chief Collection on both Xbox One and PC, players have more options now than ever, but at the time it was a welcome addition if only to try and justify the $60 price tag at launch. That's not to say it wasn't a nice inclusion, because Halo 3's multiplayer is a blast. I'm saving my thoughts on Halo's multiplayer as a whole for a future video, but I'll say this. I plan on capturing a game or two just for this section, but I ended up losing a few hours just playing Slayer or Big Team Battle. Needless to say, it brought me back to the good old days. You may have noticed a pattern with some of the games I choose to discuss. Games that aren't afraid to do something new or unique with its established formula. Games that shake up how a series is played. ODST is that game for the Halo franchise in a good way. Is Halo 3 ODST the best Halo game? No, not at all. But it is the most unique, which is why it stuck with me after all these years. After the release of Halo 3, ODST felt like the game Halo needed. While Reach would innovate and iterate on the series core, a little bit too much depending on who you ask, ODST instead opted for a different tone and feel while retaining what everyone loved about the gameplay. It's different enough to stand amongst the rest of the series, but doesn't fundamentally change the core of Halo like Guardians did. It's got unique storytelling, a fantastic atmosphere, and it's just a lot of fun to play, whether that be campaign or firefight. What was meant to be a small offshoot title to fulfill a contractual obligation ended up becoming a beautiful little Halo experience, and I admire Bungie's resolve and passion for their craft and for the series so many of us hold near and dear.